The Austro-Hungarian or KUK 35th Infantry Division had a decorative experience prior to its arrival in France in 1918. In May of 1917, they had been transferred from Russia to Italy. There they had participated at the 10th and 11th Battle of the Azonzo, before being part of the spearhead that happened at Tolmin during the Battle of Caporetto. Although highly distinguished in these actions, the division had suffered heavily. Each infantry company was only able to muster 100 men or less. Experienced officers and NCOs had also been diminished. Despite this, the units in the division did not require military censorship, nor had the division been found to have signs of war weariness. Disembarking in France in July of 1918, the 35th Infantry Division was under the command of Field Marshal Lieutenant Eugene von Podhoronsky with approximately 10,000 men. The division was organized into two separate infantry brigades, the 69th and 70th Infantry Brigaden, each of which consisted of two infantry regiments containing the Infantry Regimentor 62, 64, 51, and 63. Each regiment had three line battalions for a total of 12 across the division. Divisional assets included the following, a field artillery brigade, the 35th Field Artillery Brigade, an observational balloon company, Balloon Company 27, a divisional cavalry squadron, 6th squadron, Hussar Regiment 4, the divisional assault battalion, Strom Battalion 35. In terms of ethnicity, the personnel of the 35th Infantry Division's regimental mustering areas were located in Hungarian Transylvania. The division consisted of Romanians, Seinberger Saxons, or German speakers, and Hungarians. While most of the officers and NCOs were Germans and Hungarians, the majority of the rank and file were Romanians. IR-62 was an exception, being predominantly Hungarian. The AOK deploying troops to France was a complete secret to even the divisional staff and their transport till the very last moments. On the 26th of July, the division, minus the 35th Field Artillery Brigade, arrived in Lorraine. The division's artillery would follow in August. On paper, the division was part of German 5 Army Corps, Army Ablong C, stationed along the Argonne Forest to Metz, including the area around Verdun. This was a quiet portion of the Western Front. The remains of the Battle of Verdun, now called the St. Mihail Salient. As many of the military operations after Verdun had been to the north of the sector, it was typical for Germans to place under strength units here. The St. Mihail Salient included various rocky ridges, dense forests, thick shrubs, dirt trenches, and a sprinkling of man-made military structures. These German defensive structures were a mixture from that of the course of the war. Each depleted German unit that had been stationed there seemed to have added something to the defenses. While the area was clogged with these strong points, these had not been prepared and made the positions lack cohesion, causing confusion and poor communications for the defenders. That said, the Entente had not made an attack on the salient by 1918. After a cursory training period of only two to three weeks, Army Abdalongsi transferred the 35th Infantry Division to the front in early August near the village of Bengus, manning a nine kilometer long section of the front. The plan was for each regiment to man various parts of the line at different times for a defense in depth strategy. This never came to be as the area was so littered with different objectives and no trenches dug by the Germans previously stationed there, the division instead went to digging in even before they saw combat. This wasn't the last damage the Germans would do to their Austro-Hungarian allies of the 35th Infantry Division. The exiting Germans told stories of French-African soldiers being cannibals, damaging the morale of some of the more superstitious men. These fears were exacerbated by a frontline battalion of IR-63 losing a good portion of their men on the night before the 24th of August, without anyone knowing till morning. Despite the men being terrified to go on German night patrols, after this incident, they were able to report to Divisional Command, the French opposite of them, the French 2nd Croissier Division, was in a similar military state, with little defenses. Then this progress was set back when men from the German 13th Landwehr Division told their Austro-Hungarian comrades the French had cursed mirrors in the line to detect their movements. After a frontline officer reported this to Divisional Command, raiding operations were scrapped. At the beginning of September, the men of the 35th Infantry Division noted the enemy finally moving 
more troops opposite of them, and finally digging in. What they didn't know was Supreme Allied Commander of the Entente, Ferdinand Falk, had ordered General John J. Pershing of the American Expeditionary Force to aid French forces in taking the St. Mihiel salient. German forces were making preparations to abandon the St. Mihiel salient to strengthen the protection of the captured iron mines of bray longue Beginning on the 8th of September, it was too little too late. After four days of moving heavy equipment out of the salient, the Entente struck on the 12th of September. The 35th Infantry Division found itself immediately adjacent to one of the main axes of the St. Mihiel Offensive. When the Entente attack began on the morning of September 12th, four battalions held the forward positions of the 35th Infantry Division. Battalions 1 and 2 of IR-62, 2nd Battalion of IR-51, and 2nd Battalion IR-63. Two were stationed in their artillery positions, 1st Battalion IR-51 and 3rd Battalion IR-62, and the remaining six battalions, some of which were positioned far behind the resting lines, were utilized as an army reserve under the direct control of Army Abdelong C. At 2 a.m., these men were pummeled by Entente artillery. Austro-Hungarian forward observers could make out 15 different Entente artillery units were targeting the 35th Infantry Division alone. With Field Marshal Lieutenant Eugene von Podoransky on vacation, the defense action was actually commanded by the 70th Infantry Brigade General Major Gustav Funk. Despite the entire division being carpeted by artillery, at 3 a.m., it was clear the enemy fire was attempting to focus on their right flank, where the 35th Infantry Division sat next to the 13th Landwehr Division. Funk, in conjunction with the army's orders to abandon the salient, had been attempting to evacuate the division, but the Central Power's confusing defensive lines now exacerbated by Entente destruction, the evacuation was only still in progress. At 7.40, the enemy artillery slackened on the division's front lines, only to begin to heat up in the division's rear. Funk ordered the division to man the front lines at 7.50. American soldiers began to assault. Although repelling the first two American waves, their third was able to capture sections of the 35th Infantry Division's line. Funk in the afternoon was made aware of the Germans to his north. The 13th Landwehr Division was dissolving. Funk, at 1.30 p.m., ordered the men of the 69th Infantry Brigade to refuse the right, just as he got a call from the German commander to the south. The German 192nd Infantry Division was withdrawing. This would expose the division's south flank in turn. When Funk regained communications with the 192nd Infantry Division, the operator interrupted the Austro-Hungarian general. Pardon me, I must interrupt. There are tanks here. The line went dead. Funk's options continued to worsen when French troops broke into the northern line and began moving on the division's artillery positions. He ordered what men he could and his reserve to push back the French and have the frontline units fall back to the rear areas. Once in strength, they would conduct a fighting withdrawal to Schroeder Stallung. This did not occur. The withdrawal was thrown into chaos. The division and brigade staff were unable to maintain communications for the rest of the 12th of September with their own units. Sections and companies of men would have to counterattack the patchwork of eclectic German various defenses in the dense woods to continue the withdrawal. But the Entente had good communications and the lower level officers knew the ground better than the Austro-Hungarians, leading to small groups being ambushed and in some cases wiped out. At one point, the 69th Infantry Brigade prepared a counterattack with two fresh battalions and various smaller units to attempt to counterattack to retake the abandoned Austro-Hungarian trenches. Funk, luckily enough, was able to intervene and cancel the counterattack orders. Throughout the afternoon, various units of the 35th Infantry Division made their way to Schrollersterlung. At 6.30, Army Command ordered the 35th Infantry Division and the 13th Landwehr Divisions to Mischelsterlung. Funk ordered IR-64, the regiment most intact, to occupy the light defensive line. The other regiments were given assembly areas for the retreating units to rally at. The rest of the 12th of September did not incur any more devastation, but the 13th of September the 35th Infantry Division was constantly strafed by American aircraft. Until the 18th of September, IR-51 and IR-62 numbered only a battalion each. For now, the entire division was expected to man a shorter area of 4.5 kilometers. 
but sported no barbed wire, only a slit dirt trench in the dense forest, and contained three hill-like features. Funk conducted light offensive operations to screen his men from enemy operations, and to give space for forward observation posts to be established. Both the 35th Infantry Division and the 13th Landwehr Division were able to use their artillery to push American units, opposite of them, back two kilometers. This was small comfort as the Entente had achieved the objective of crushing the St. Mihiel salient. The 35th Division had lost 99 officers and 3,268 other ranks, 102 machine guns, 10 artillery pieces, 33 mortars, and 19 howitzers. But under General Funk, the division had survived the deadly Entente mauling. On the 21st of September, Kaiser Wilhelm himself visited the army headquarters. The Kaiser greeted the 35th Infantry Division officers at the HQ and some Austro-Hungarian casualties at the local hospitals. On the 23rd of September, 14 officers and 620 other ranks as reinforcements from the 34th and 60th Marche Baton helped bring the divisional manpower up. For the remainder of the war, the Austro-Hungarian soldiers continued to straggle back to their own lines. Over time, the four infantry regiments were able to re-achieve their three battalion status. Light patrols and return artillery fire dominated their front line until the 11th of November, ending their wartime service. But of the 10,000 men that on the 26th of July opened their train car doors to a secret unknown location and fought for their empire, less than 7,000 survived till the armistice, and none of them would return to the Austro-Hungarian Empire.